Tonight, we are remembering the remarkable life of Senator John McCain, who has died at the age of 81 after battling brain cancer. Republican Ben Sass said, quote, our nation aches for truth tellers. This man will be greatly missed. Senator McCain's story is the American story. He once wrote, I'm the son and the grandson of admirals. That's the first line of my biography. That's a fact that his captors in Vietnam tried to use against him. McCain refused to let them and found himself using taps on the wall to communicate with other prisoners of war from his prison cell. He returned home after five and a half years and spent decades in public life, chiefly in his beloved United States Senate. In the end, he never became president, losing to George W. Bush and later Barack Obama. And he resisted a changing of the guard in politics, often at odds with President Donald Trump. And the two shared a little more in common than their political party. And yet, McCain did not yield. Most wondrous land on earth indeed. I've had the good fortune to spend 60 years in service to this wondrous land, to fear the world we have organized and led the three quarters of a century, to abandon the ideals we have advanced around the globe, to refuse the obligations of international leadership and our duty to remain the last best hope of earth for the sake of some half-baked, spurious nationalism cooked up by people who would rather find scapegoats than solve problems. This is un is as unpatriotic as an attachment to any other tired dogma of the past that Americans consigned to the ash, cheap, the ash heap of history. Hmm. Remarkable. He was known by his colleagues in the Senate as a man unafraid to reach across the aisle and unafraid of bucking his own party for what he thought was the good of the country. One of his colleagues, Democratic Senator from Minnesota, Amy Klobuchar, joins me now from Minneapolis. Senator Klobuchar, it's good to see you uh, on this very somber weekend. Uh, but we've been remembering Senator McCain here tonight uh, for, of course, the accomplishments that he brought, but also for the man that he was. And I know you spent quite a bit of time traveling with him. Uh, there was a New Year's Eve uh, incident in the Baltics, I'm told, among other things. Uh, what do you remember about him? Well, Casey, I loved how you captured his sense of humor and how, for him, jabbing at you a bit in good humor good humor was a compliment. Um, there's nothing better when you're a Democrat and you got a call from John McCain, which I did several times, where he'd say, I just saw you on, on Sunday morning uh, defending immigration. He goes, pretty good for a communist. Um, <laughs> that was a compliment. And uh, he uh, was someone that just had a joy about his work. And yes, as you know, uh, he could get crabby, he could get intense, uh, but he had a mission. And that mission, I was reminded of the last time I saw him when my husband and I uh, went out to the ranch to see him and Cindy. And he was frail, uh, but still showed that true grit as he talked about the issues of the day. Uh, but he pointed to a line from one of his books where he said, nothing in life is more liberating than fighting for a cause greater than yourself. And that's what defined his life, whether it was, you know, letting those other prisoners of war being released before him. I stood with him in front of that cell in Vietnam and saw how small that place was where he was tortured, whether it was working in the Senate, as you point out, bucking his party on everything from immigration to being against torture, or whether it was his decision in a solitary moment in Minnesota at that rally when that woman questioned Barack Obama's patriotism, and he looked at her in a very polite way and said, ma'am, no, you're wrong, ma'am. He was a family man. He was a decent, he is a decent person. That's what he said. And those are decisions, some were made over time, but some were made in the moment. And that was John McCain. Really demonstrated the instincts that he had in that moment. He also was known as being a mentor uh, to other senators. He was somebody who cared deeply about the institution. And it sounds as though he played that role for you. 
He did, and I'm sure you can think of people in your life, men uh, who came before you and helped you out and introduced you around. Well, that's what he did uh, to so many senators, and especially women senators, on the world stage. And at times when we would be at meetings with all male leaders, especially in Asia, and it was Lindsay and me and John McCain. And of course, John McCain would start. He was the head of the delegation. And then they would all turn to look at Lindsey Graham. And every single time, John McCain would look at them and say, I'm sorry, Senator Klobuchar is the Democratic lead of this delegation. She will go next. Um, and he was in that moment telling them, no, this woman is someone to listen to. And I can't tell you how many other women, Democrats and Republicans, have told me similar stories. And part of it may be that he spent his life surrounded by powerful women, uh, from his mother, uh, who is still alive, uh, to Cindy McCain, who's an incredibly strong person, uh, to Megan and the rest of the family. And yeah. that may have sculpted who he was in those moments with women in the Senate. Roberta McCain, his mother, 106 years old. Really, really remarkable. Uh, Chuck Schumer, uh, your Democratic leader, has proposed renaming the Russell Senate office building for Senator McCain. Is that something you would support? Of course. Um, I think it is a very smart idea. It's a place, as you know, Casey, that uh, John McCain, when you talk about walking those marble floors, it's where he worked uh, for years. And it also embodies the traditions of the Senate in that it's the oldest Senate office building. Um, and he is, was a student of history. Every trip that I went with him on, he was constantly reading books, World War II books, taking those lessons of history, which you heard in that talk he gave on half-baked nationalism not so long ago and bringing them to the present, understanding what that threat of Russia really meant. And if I learned anything from him on foreign policy, it was that the lessons of history matter and that America is at its strongest when we are a beacon to de for democracies around the world and that we shouldn't shirk from that duty. Senator Amy Klobuchar, thank you so much for coming on tonight and sharing your thoughts and reflections. It was I really great, appreciate Casey. it. Thank you. And thank you for capturing Senator McCain with that moment uh, where he was teasing you um, about your role as <laughs> a journalist, because he did that so well. He did. And, uh, and we, we really miss him in the halls of the Hill, as, as I know you know. So thank you. I want to now to welcome in my panel tonight, senior writer for Politico and co-author of the Politico Playbook, Jake Sherman, Republican strategist and director of media affairs for John McCain's 2008 campaign, Kevin McLaughlin, political columnist for The Washington Post, Karen Tumulty, Republican strategist, former advisor for Senator McCain and MSNBC political analyst, Mike Murphy. Thank you all for being here uh, tonight. And I want first, Karen has written a definitive obituary of Senator McCain. And Karen, you write in The Washington Post, quote, when he acted like an ordinary politician, trimming principles in the cause of ambition and experience, it was all the more jarring because of the standard he had set. In the years that followed, a question often asked was, which is the real John McCain? So which one is it? Well, there really was, John McCain had this code of honor that I think, on the one hand, both defined him, but I think it was also a burden. I think it also haunted him because when he fell short of his own standards, he was in torment. You, you ask what was the worst moment when he was a prisoner of war? It wasn't being tortured. It wasn't the, all those years of solitary confinement. It was, it, was, it was when after having his arms rebroken, he was forced to sign a sort of stilted yeah. confession. Um, so. Again, you don't see that sort of kind of internal, you know, th that internal code of honor in that many politicians. So yes, he was both. He was both of those John McCain's. He was the John McCain who aspired to perfection, and he's the John McCain who sometimes fell short. Yeah. Mike Murphy, uh, pick up on that on that point. You're somebody who uh, worked with McCain in 2000 on that sort of improbable run that he made against uh, George W. Bush when he really earned for all of the country that nickname of Maverick. Yeah, well, he um, <laughs> he was a rascal. He, <laughs> he was driven by honor. His entire focus was serving with honor, but he was also human and he knew his flaws and he was very hard on himself because he was a 
you know, a flawed person like all of us. So, and he was in the political world where you spend half your time trying to navigate minefields with honor and the other half your time suffering fools, which it took him some patience to do. So it was a lot of fun about I'm not about sure he actually had the patience to, to suffer fools. <laughs> I don't know that he actually and, had you know, that I patience. think he had pretty remarkable patience. I was around a lot of the fools he was suffering. And uh, <laughs> it was pretty remarkable in 2000. I think the whole temper thing's overrated. I think people miss it, which is McCain would, what McCain never liked in life, excuse me, <clears throat> were what he, his favorite word, both joking, he didn't mean it, but he did sometimes behind closed doors, jerks and bullies. So when he saw somebody with power bullying down, he had an instinctive dislike of it. And so, you know, there's a lot of that foolishness in politics. But, but fundamentally, what he tried to do, and I thought was very successful in doing through his career, was put his own compass first and the hell with it if, if there was political trouble. Now, he was also Scotch-Irish and he loved to fight. So he was able to bring those <laughs> two things together. But, but he was very unique and there was nobody who was more fun to work with, particularly in 2000 in a long shot campaign, we had nothing to lose. And it was like a bank heist and he was in the middle of it. And he had a terrific time because he was allowed to be himself and he saw that it resonated in the country, his yeah. sort of politics. So McCain came up short twice in his bids for president. He lost the 2000 primary we were just talking about to George W. Bush. And eight years later, of course, the general election to Barack Obama. And with the campaign reaching its fever pitch in October of 2008, McCain, of course, could see the writing on the wall. And I come here tonight to the Al Smith dinner knowing that I'm the underdog in these final weeks. But if you know where to look, there are signs of hope. There are signs of hope, even in the most unexpected places, even in this room full of proud Manhattan Democrats. I can't, I can't shake that feeling that some people here are pulling for me. I'm delighted to see you here tonight, Hillary. <laughs> I don't want it getting out of this room, but my opponent is an impressive fellow in many ways. Political opponents can have a little trouble seeing the best in each other, but I've had a few glimpses of this man at his best, and I admire his great skill, energy, and determination. It's not for nothing that he's inspired so many folks in his own party and beyond. Senator Obama talks about making history and he's made quite a bit of it already. There was a time when the mere invitation of an African-American citizen to dine at the White House was taken as an outrage and an insult in many quarters. Today is a world away from the cruel and prideful bigotry of that time and good riddance. I can't wish my opponent luck, but I do wish him well. Kevin McLaughlin, where, where is that in our politics yeah. today? Where is it? We watched how Republicans reacted after Charlottesville. It's so far yeah. from what John McCain did right there. Yeah. I, you know, I think it's been a long slog to get to where we are right now. Um, seeing him talk and think about 2008. And I was, I was at the, the McCain campaign in the 2007 primary, and it was just brutal. You know, I was in, I was in charge of radio and TV, which meant I talked to, you know, the, the right wingers of, of the whole thing. And John McCain was for the McCain Kennedy uh, immigration bill and the surge in Iraq. And we just would get crushed every day. And there's even these conspiracy theories about what Karen was talking about, that signed confession that circulate on the right, right that exactly. are stunning. They call him a traitor. In, like every day we'd get to work at six, we'd stand at the desk and hope to God we'd get through the day and like 9.30 we'd come out and everything would be okay. But McCain, he, he, he had this ability in the military, I think they have a saying, it's like, do the, do the hard right as opposed to the easy wrong. And it totally embodied him. He came yeah. back from Iraq when he met the, so the soldier who got shot through the eye, who grabbed him by the arm and, and, and whispered in his ear, I'm, I'm pulling for you. And he came right in the campaign office and was just like a mess. He was off the plane and he was crying and everyone was crying. And it made it so much bigger and so much easier to work in those terrible days. Yeah, Jake Sherman, on Capitol Hill, it's clear that 
people who have spent a lot of time up there, uh, you know, really loved him and Republicans. Uh, loved him. This president, though, um, not so much. No, definitely not. Uh, and I think part of it, I'm not, I, it's tough to put anybody on, a, on the psychiatric couch, but John McCain, I don't think there's anybody in the Senate or in the House who could go out into the world and meet with world leaders and have the gravitas that McCain has. He's almost like seen as a head of state yeah. uh, when he's out there in the world, out there on congressional delegations, meeting with people and uh, leaders around the world. He's He commands that kind of respect. And thinking through the elected officials that we have now, there's really nobody else like that. But I think the president has had a long distaste for John McCain for whatever reason. In 1999, in an interview, I think, with Dan Rather uh, on 60 Minutes, brought up the, the, the idea that he was captured. So this is something that's been going on for decades, right? I mean, so it's not a new thing. And I'm glad that you make that point, because the Washington Post is reporting tonight that President Trump squashed plans for a White House statement praising the life and heroism of Senator John McCain. Current and former White House aides tell the Post that the statement was drafted before McCain's death, and it was ready for the president to sign off on it. But upon review, the president reportedly decided he would rather post a brief tweet instead. That read, quote, my deepest sympathies and respect go out to the family of Senator John McCain. Our hearts and prayers are with you. The Post is reporting, as well, your colleagues, uh, Karen, uh, that this White House statement would have called him a hero, praised his military service, and this president elected not to do that. Uh, it's it's sort of small on the president's part. It, it's reminiscent of him going and signing the defense authorization bill a couple of weeks ago, which is named for John McCain and not mentioning John McCain's name. Because it does appear that with Donald Trump, everything is about Donald Trump. And so he has a feud going with him, and he will not let go of it. He will not look at John McCain in the larger lens of his service to this country, which was incredible and lasted for many decades. But I think it's important to also note, I think we, if you look at George W. Bush is going to eulogize John McCain, they had one of the nastiest primaries in recent presidential history. So it, it is possible to disagree with somebody politically and, and still be respectful and when they... I mean, there was some very personal stuff in that 2000 very. campaign around Senator McCain's daughter, uh, and yet he's still, of course, extending forgiveness and, and asked. We're, we've been reporting that, that McCain personally asked uh, both Bush and Obama to deliver those eulogies. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.